Hello, I am Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, and I'm glad once again to be joined by Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another Somerville Journal, Somerville Media Center News Roundup. Hello, Julia. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so there's the uh, we're recording this on uh, on Wednesday, September second. So that means that uh, the primary, the September primary, just happened last night, and we will we will get to that uh, among some other uh, burning topics uh, that summer villains are are concerned about. Um, so, but we are going to start off the way that we have been starting off these uh, this whole time with an update on coronavirus, uh, and summer bill. Uh, so Julia, why don't you head us off with that? Awesome. Yes. So there hasn't been as much news around this lately, especially with everything going on with elections. Um, but of course, you know, this is still something that our city and state and country and planet is navigating. Um, <laughs> let's bring it out real quick. Um, so if, you know, there's still a lot of information up on the city website about it. Um, there are still people who are getting COVID in Somerville. Um, the cases are still remaining pretty, um, pretty low. We did have one more fatality. Um, so at this point, there have been um, 1,133 confirmed positive cases. Currently, there are 92 probable positive cases. And um, over a thousand, so 1,094 have recovered. And at this point, there have been 38 confirmed fatalities. Last time we checked in about this, there had been 37, which had held pretty steady for about a month. So we did have one more death from COVID, sadly. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, yes, I see you pulled up the interactive map. Awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is another, we talked about this uh, last time. This is a great tool um, for kind of checking in on where Somerville is at. Um, it's, it's really cool to kind of see how many tests are, are being administered. That remains really important. Um, CHA is still conducting testing at Assembly Square. Um, it's the same process as always. If you, we have a number of stories up, you can go on their website. You just have to call to make an appointment. Um, and the city is still recommending that everyone be tested if you're going to see family, if you're definitely if you're going traveling anywhere. Um, if you suspect you might have symptoms, if you think you might have been exposed to someone who has symptoms. Um, but what is actually interesting is if you see from this map, um, last time we checked in about this, Somerville was green, and now Somerville is yellow. So that means that cases are, the incidence of cases and the rate of um, cases daily is increasing. Mm. So that's going in the, the not great direction. Um, and is there anything that that's being attributed to right at the moment? Not at this time. Um, I think I think what is on everyone's minds is the university reopening. Um, that is not that has not been directly attributed. Tufts has been conducting thousands of tests. Um, but I think um, that, you know there's a number of things with with businesses continuing to reopen um, with even small weather shifts. Yeah, there you go. Um, I haven't heard specifically any like why exactly this is happening. It, it certainly isn't that bad yet. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is, you know, not to say that it's going to, we're going to go directly to red. Somerville has been very cautious. It's been doing kind of, you know, a really good job of this um, throughout the pandemic. Um, but no, at this time, there isn't a ton of information about why that is. That's um, interesting to know. Yeah, a lot to a lot that we could surmise at this point, and uh, I'm curious to to see. Yeah, um, it is something interesting to keep in mind because um, recently the city did announce that we'll be beginning to move into phase three, step one, which right. the city has been holding off for a long, many, many weeks, um, while the state and other cities have moved forward. Um, so it's phase three, step one, and the city did say specifically that. Um, they will do this if the data continues to trend in the right direction. If the data continues to trend in the right direction. And when I spoke with city um, spokespeople, that was really what they kind of hammered home, that this is definitely something they want to do. Um, the city is considering you know, a limited reopening for fitness centers, gyms, indoor recreation facilities around September 8th, but it is dependent on this data continuing to trend in the right direction. Um, so while that has kind of been the announcement and they've been meeting with these businesses for several weeks, um, I think the most recent meeting was on the 31st of August. Um, it's still, it's, it's not a guarantee. <laughs> Nothing is, I suppose. 
Um, and there's always that fear that, you know, they're going to reopen and then have to kind of pull back, um, which I think is what the city is trying to avoid. Right. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot. Um, there's many measures that the city is kind of talking to these, um, these businesses about. There's kind of gathering capacity limits, which are still going to remain pretty strict. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot. You know, and, and I think, I think um, it's going to be interesting to kind of see how this all goes. Because I know a lot of these businesses are anxious to reopen because other businesses in other cities, you know, some rural is an, an isolated island, are already opening. Right. Um, so I, I think there's a bit of a sense of urgency that like we, we need to open, we need to be kind of doing business as best we can at the moment. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how all this goes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Somerville has been uh, both criticized and praised for <laughs> its, its extra uh, caution when it comes to uh, business reopenings. Uh, it's, it, you know, as, as you said, it, it's been a few weeks that the full, that the state uh, as a whole has allowed for phase three reopenings and uh, um, Joe Curtitoni and, and the city leaders uh, have decided to hold off um, just in an effort to just keep numbers down in a very densely populated city such as Somerville. So um, yeah, yeah, we will, we will see um, what we see and hopefully the numbers continue on a downward trend um, so that, you know, the full phase three reopening can be done safely. Absolutely. And we can, we can touch on that more when we, when we talk about um, some local businesses initiative in a moment, but um, to, to talk about uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the uh, primary elections. So yeah, there was there was some pretty uh, uh, important primary uh, things on the ballot uh, mm -hmm. statewide, and then also at the local level. So um, why don't we uh, why don't why don't you touch on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so <laughs> I was definitely up late last night waiting yeah. for these results. Um, Somerville did a great job of getting these in, actually pretty early, um, all things considered. Uh, because I think it was it was a tough year. There were Maryland ballots. There were ballot drop boxes all over the city. There was a lot to do for the elections department in Somerville. Um, but it was, you know, everything seemed to have gone well. The unofficial election totals have been posted. Um, there were 25,682 ballots cast. Um, the unofficial is, results um, didn't include the current number of registered voters, but in the March election, the number of registered voters was a little over um, 56,000. So it, we can probably assume it's a little bit more than that. Um, but that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good rate. Um, a little less than half of the registered voters in Somerville, um, which for a primary is pretty good. <laughs> um, I'm definitely, um, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, still looking at the these results, this was obviously just last night, and I definitely want to kind of do a breakdown on voter turnout and what, what it's been like in the past and what we can expect um, moving forward. But this isn't totally surprising because there were a number of um, contested races, especially um, Democratic races. There was one Republican um, primary um, in the for the Senate, Senate seat. Um, so there were the vast majority of the ballots cast in Somerville were Democratic. Um, mm -hmm. So of the 25-ish thousand, um, about 24,000 were Democratic uh, ballots, um, around a little under a thousand were Republican, and then there were a few Green and Libertarian ballots cast as well. Um, but yes, it, you know, it was really interesting. So there were, um, the races that we've been kind of covering most closely um, were the um, senator in the second Middlesex race, so Pat Jalen's seat, um, the 27th Middlesex state representative seat, which is where um, Denise Provo is stepping down, and the 34th Middlesex seat, which was um, Christine Barber's seat um, versus Anna Callahan. Um, but there are also more races. So Somerville voters also voted for the governor's council, um, which was Terrence Kennedy, who's the incumbent versus Helena Bonte. Right. And yeah. Also, of course, the statewide um, senator race, Markey versus Kennedy. Um, so, was, yeah, looking at, at um, Terrence Kennedy versus Helena Fontes, like, it mm -hmm. seems like there was some overwhelming support for Elena Fontes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. For this, this, and um, I noticed that Mike Connolly uh, posted something on Facebook offering his support for 
Alina Fontes, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that ha- that did something to do to to, to sway to sway voters. Sure, um, many Somerville uh, lo- local legislators as well threw their support behind yeah. Alina Fontes. Yeah, very mm-hmm. interesting there. Um, yeah, so this was it was it was an interesting race. So Somerville, um, if you scroll up, I think they have the Kennedy Markey. Yeah. So Somerville pretty strongly went for Markey. Yeah, <laughs> um, I would say. Pretty evidently, <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, you know, that race was called, so Markey has won a re-election in Massachusetts, um, but it was definitely not even much of a fight in Somerville. Um, Ayanna Presley was not um, contested. Um, as yet, as we can see, Somerville pretty strongly went for Fontes, who also won the election. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as we know, um, as far as I know so far, counting Somerville and Medford results, um, Pat Jalen has won re-election in her seat. Um, that district also includes um, parts of Cambridge and Winchester. Um, so I haven't seen those results with my own eyes, but I believe that race has been called. Um, Mike Connolly didn't have a challenger. Um, one of the most contested races was um, Katya Sharp and Erica Eiderhoven, both being newcomers. Um, there was a lot to talk about. You know, I mean, neither one had this kind of like incumbent record. Um, but it was, you know, it was a race well run for both of them. Um, the race was called Katya Sharp has, um, conceded the race. So Erica Eiderhoven will be the new representative in the 27th Middlesex district. Um, it was, you know, there were people on both sides in Somerville advocating for both candidates, um, having spoken with both of them, they both seemed like pretty awesome humans. Um, but I'm sure Erica will do a great job representing the 27th Middlesex, um, and then from what I can see as well, Medford and Somerville results, um, Christine Barber, who was the incumbent candidate, won re-election. Um, so she will again represent the 34th Middlesex District. Um, this is uh, Medford results as well. And I believe that she, she was posting about it on social media that she has won re-election. Um, but Anna Callahan, also a very cool human, um, ran a very cool campaign. So awesome, awesome all around. Yeah. Um, and then the register was not was not contested. Um, but those were kind of the big races. Um, and then Somerville, like I said, there were not very many Republican ballots cast, but yeah. there was um, there was a, rep- a primary for a senator um, who will go against um, Markey kind of on the ticket. Um, so this was, again, there weren't very many ballots cast, but by a margin of a couple hundred votes, um, Kevin O'Connor won in Somerville even though there weren't very many ballots cast, but as far as Republican ballots go. So the Republican challenger will uh, go against Markey in the November ballot? Right. So yeah, so this was the primary to see who would be the Republican challenger. Yes. Um, So the candidates were Shiva Ayodurai and Kevin O'Connor. So Kevin, I believe Kevin won the primary statewide. um, So he will be on the ticket as the Republican candidate. Very interesting. And, you know, I'm sure that, that we'll see a lot more analysis of this uh, in Absolutely. your paper. <laughs> in yeah. I love looking at this stuff. I think it's so interesting and comparing it to kind of just how what things were before and, you know, how did Somerville come out in the last primary and yeah. how many races were contested. I think it's really interesting to look at stuff like that, especially with all the conversations that are happening around um, voter suppression, you know, voter like just all the things that are going on heading into this November election, it's a very important November election. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think it's important to, to look at this and to know where we are, you know, how many voters are registered in Somerville, how many of those voters are voting. Um, why, why not? You know what I mean? Why, why wouldn't someone be moved to vote? I think it's interesting stuff to talk about. So yes, I'll definitely be writing more about it. And it was, uh, it was an interesting uh, kind of test for the ballot boxes that we saw around yes. town uh, where people could, drop off their, their mail-in ballots. Um, and have you heard anything yet? Is it too soon to, for the, uh, for the elections commission to, uh, the local elections commission to have, uh, said how that, how that went? Uh, I haven't heard anything yet. Definitely going to be reaching out. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's, def- there's definitely some mixed opinions from the public. I think a lot of people were really excited about it. They were happy, you know, there's, it's more accessible. Um, it's much easier to drop off your ballots. For example, I'm a Cambridge resident and there was one ballot drop box at the electing, election commission at, at 51 Inman. So I, you know, drove there <laughs> and delivered my ballot. Um, and in Somerville, there were a number of places you go. There are 10 ballot drop boxes. Um, but at the same time, I know, um, for example, some residents were concerned about like 
who's picking up the ballots? Like, who do we have responsible for this? Right. Um, is it, I think there were uh, DPW staff were doing a lot of it, um, which some people were fine with and some people had concerns about. And, you know, I, I think um, there were definitely mixed, mixed opinions on kind of how, how this was set up. Um, but I, I'm definitely looking forward to talking to the city about how they feel it went and, you know, yeah. whether like how they feel about it heading into the November election, if they're going to do the same thing, if they're going to do more, if they're going to do less, um, what feels right. So I'm not sure yet, but I'll try to get some answers. And the city also expanded the, uh, absentee voting. They, they moved it up by a few weeks yep. to just allow for more people to, to vote early. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And just passing by City Hall, when I dropped off my ballot at the uh, at the box in front of City Hall, I saw you know people trickle in and out for that for that early voting, um, and it seemed to work just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, they had an outside tent, um, they had all the the kind of paperwork that needed to happen up there. People went in briefly to cast their vote, and then they came right back out. And there wasn't any, at least when I when I saw it, there wasn't a, a long line. You know, there wasn't any line. Mm -hmm. uh, people were able to just go right in. So I'm sure, I'm sure uh, that they're going to use that model for for November because from what I saw, it was working really well. That's awesome. Oh, that's so great. Very cool. All right, great elections news there. Always fun <laughs> to talk about elections. <laughs> um, and then moving on to local business, uh, we we actually both had separate interviews with um, uh, the Arts the Armory director, uh, Stephanie. Sure. Yes, uh, Stephanie. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, so uh, there's, a, there's a video feature out there uh, that we made, and then you did a write-up about a new initiative of the Thurs. Um, so what is this new initiative? Sure. Um, so I had the opportunity to talk to Stephanie. Um, we actually, I called her about this arts impact petition that she was one of the kind of signers of um, to requesting yeah. more like support and aid from the city. Um, and when we were talking about that, she was telling me about Rooted, which is the, the new initiative at the Armory, which is a cafe as well as kind of like a farm stand or like market. Um, so anyone who knows the Armory, um, I love the Armory. Um, they, they've had a cafe for a while. Um, it's delightful. They have open mics. They have a tiny little stage in the corner. They have really yummy uh, sandwiches and treats and cookies. And um, it's a very cozy place. Um, yeah. But obviously, you know, it's, it's been really hard <laughs> for arts organizations um, of, of all kinds, kind of, you know, of all disciplines. Um, and they, as a, you know, as a venue, the, I mean, the Armory is... Um, it's a gallery. It's, it's, it's a lot of things, but it's primarily like a gathering place. I mean, they, they host galas, they host um, farmers markets, they host, um, I've been to like the vegan market there. They host tons, tons of different things. Um, they host community meetings. I've been to a summer vision meeting there. It's just, uh, you know, a fashion show. Um, Yum has been hosted there, the Welcome Project's annual um, just delicious um, food celebration. Um, so they just, they're a real, um, you know, arts and cultural institution in the city. Um, but it's COVID times, so there aren't many events going on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's been really hard. Um, and when I was talking with Stephanie, she, she spoke quite candidly about the challenges that they are facing. Um, and, you know, this was related to the petition to the city to kind of direct more funds to them. But what she was saying is, you know, you know, they've, they've applied for grants, they've applied for loans, they're, they will continue doing all of this, you know, to try to find, you know, sources of funding. Um, but really what she was saying is that like they needed, they needed some sort of steady income. They needed to be able to rely on something, you know what I mean? So what they did was they came up with this idea um, to, to open a cafe, kind of like what they had before, but also a farm stand. So they have produce from local farms. They have products from local vendors um, like Dana's Pasta um, and other spots in the city, you know, for candy, for pasta, for pies, for all sorts of things. And then they also use local ingredients. So stuff from local vendors in the menu that they have. So in sandwiches and salads and all of that. Um, so it's really like this just hyper local, yummy, like market and cafe. Um, and the kind of the hope is that this will serve two purposes. Like on, on one hand, it will kind of serve their mission, which has been really hard, you know, being closed during a pandemic, like not really being sure what to do. And even though I remember Stephanie said, she was like, it might not sound like a market is like, 
the same, like serves the mission of an arts organization, but she was like, our mission, part of it is to like, just support the like local creative um, economy and just the local like business economy. Cause they also manage the summer of a winter farmer's market. So that's really still kind of in their, in their purview. So she's like, we just want to, you know, get back to serving the community and just being here, doing what we love to do. Um, and also hopefully, you know, generate some regular kind of more dependable revenue so that we yeah. can, you know, keep our staff <laughs> and just survive this, um, in, in, in a kind of basic sense. Um, and she was happy. She said that, you know, this whole venture has allowed them to, you know, bring some staff back to work, um, to, you know, to work the cafe. They have some outdoor seating for up to 20 people, um, have new signs up. It looks, it looks really great. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough time. Yeah. Um, so if, if you were ever going to kind of stop by the armory for <laughs> a bite or a cup of coffee, uh, now is definitely the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just, I, I agree with you in my conversation with uh, Stephanie Scherf that um, the, the act, the critical kind of nature of their their status right now as a nonprofit organization is is it, it, she couldn't state that enough um, and it echoes what a lot of nonprofit uh, organizations as well as small businesses are going through right now it's just with this dramatic drop in funding um, either income or funding uh, you know like you said the the armory it's it's largely a performance and rental space they have that giant beautiful um, you know open space. And, you know, all the, all the great events that you mentioned that you've been to, you know, our, our gala fundraiser was there as well. Um, it, none of that since March. So all those rentals are gone. So, yeah, yeah. So if you're out there, if you're walking along Highland Ave, if you're driving by, you know, stop by Rooted and help support this nonprofit organization that's, that's in a really critical moment right now. Uh, yeah, and sure. honestly, the the thing that's so beautiful and generous I find about this is that, yes, right, like drive by, stop and support this arts organization who is simultaneously supporting local vendors right. and local people who live in our community, work in our community, like create in our community. You know what I mean? Like it's it's all of it. So mm -hmm. like you're supporting the arts at the Armory and their ability to survive us and continue to be that place, that gathering place for all of us. And at the same time, they're making it possible for you to support all of these other local vendors so that they can continue being wonderful stewards in our community. It's so beautiful. I love it. <laughs> and I will just add that as a nonprofit organization, Somerville Media Center, we'll be doing a, a fundraiser in October, the week of October 9th, uh, Community Media Week. We've done it for the past few years. And, um, you know, we also had to postpone our gala from April. So we'll have some, some an event, uh, a virtual event linked to that. So more details on that in the upcoming week. I can't wait. Me too. That's exciting. <laughs> And then uh, to wrap up on kind of a, an interesting note, um, <laughs> there's been some, there's been a, a spate of graffiti of a racist nature uh, around the city. So what do you, what, do, what have you found out about that? Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, I know this is a tough, a tough topic, um, but I think it's, it's important to talk about. Um, there have been several incidents of racist graffiti, um, mostly concentrated in Somerville's Ward 2. So run right around your area. <laughs> um, the, the couple that I have reported on at this time um, was at a private residence in the neighborhood um, and also at Trina Starlight Lounge, which is in Inman, kind of right on the border of Somerville and Cambridge. Um, both um, were kind of explicitly, um, the home had a Black Lives Matter sign. Trina's also had a Black Lives Matter sign as well as a No Justice, No Peace sign. Um, Trina's was pretty heavily targeted. Um, they had those signs kind of painted over, crossed out. Um, but they also had, um, if, if you've ever walked by Trina's, they have a very colorful facade. They've got, you know, lots of paint. Their logo is kind of all over the place and they have like the snack shack and all this fun stuff. They have a mural. Um, so a lot of those were kind of either X'd out or painted over or had kind of um, just either kind of rude, just even just rude or racist kind of things painted over it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the home was similar. They had um, their Black Lives Matter sign um, painted over with kind of racist things. And then there was actually also some uh, spray paint on their actual home, on the side of their home. Hmm. Um, 
which was kind of facing the street. Um, so that incident, uh, the man I talked to, um, he, he found this graffiti when he had gotten home from vacation. Um, so there isn't, I've spoken with police, there isn't a total, uh, he is not entirely sure when this happened. Um, Trina's starlight um, is pretty positive. It happened kind of on a Thursday night into a Friday. Um, but, and it's, it's possible that the private home was also vandalized around that time. But at this point, the police have said that they're not entirely, they're not, they can't confirm whether it's connected. There's a detective assigned to these case, to these cases. Um, and they're investigating them. You know what I mean? That's kind of where we're at with those particular cases. But, um, why I wanted to bring this up is because while those are the two that I have reported on at this time, I've already, um, seen evidence of more incidents happening. So War Two counselor JT Scott posted on Twitter um, about an incident at the Sacramento Street underpass um, where there, there was racist um, wording kind of graffitied under the underpass, um, which had been, was painted over by DPW and then actually was painted again, was repainted again, um, not long after that. Um, there's also been some graffiti on s just kind of like signs around and around Union Square construction. Um, and I just heard, I have not confirmed this, but I've just heard that there's also some graffiti um, around the master's used cars um, business mm -hmm. in, um, in around Union. Um, so basically, there there's just been kind of a, a slew of incidents. The police have not confirmed whether they are connected. They are under investigation. Um, but I wanted to just bring this up um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, I just wanted the public to know that I am kind of looking into this so that if it happens to you to please reach out, um, of course, to the police. <laughs> but I, I would also love to hear from you about kind of what happened and your experience of it and whether you have any information. Um, but also just because I when I was speaking with um, Emma Hollander, who's one of the managing partners of Trina Starlight Lounge, she she had some really powerful things to say about it. She, she seems like a really cool human. Um, but she said, you know, it was obviously a really tough, traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. um, she's a business owner. It's hard, you know, I mean, to have your business defaced. Um, you gotta, there's costs associated with it. It's just unpleasant. Um, due to kind of the nature of the graffiti, it can also make you feel a little unsafe, I think, um, you know, in this, in this area. Um, but one thing she said was, um, she was like, I think that we kind of in this area in, in New England or in the Northeast, um, we kind of think that we're immune from it, that like it doesn't happen here, like only happens down in Georgia or like in the South or whatever. Um, but she was like, you know, if anything, you know, I'm not happy this happened, but I'm happy that people see that this is an issue that's happening here. Um, and the other thing she said was like, she was like, I honestly, if anything, this just shows that we're doing something so right that we're making people angry. That was kind of her attitude, um, which was really cool. It was really uh, strong, you know, to hear, yeah. to hear from a local business owner um, after experiencing something like that. Um, so, and you know, it's a tough issue. I'm not happy to you know see this happening in our neighborhoods, um, but I think it's something worthy of investigation. So I would just ask, you know, anyone to come forward if you, you know anything or have seen anything. Absolutely. And uh, so just to follow up on that story and on any, any of the other topics that we talked about, uh, be sure to head over to the Somerville Journal website, which is somerville.wickedlocal.com. You know or, or, <laughs> Somervillejournal.com. <laughs> <Yes. either one. laughs> and uh, you can also uh, check this out on the Somerville Community Access Television, Cable Channel 3, or somervillemedia.org. Or if you have a Roku device, we even have a channel on there. So search for Somerville uh, and we'll pop up there. Um, so as always, Julia, it was really great to catch up with uh, the, the goings on here in our little corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, be well. And uh, I, I thank you for, for being a regular guest. Uh, oh, thank I, you. Yeah, I, love I, I love this. And <laughs> I hope our viewers love it. And um, if you do, you know, reach out and we will see you next time.